Signore e signori, buonasera e benvenuti e bentornati a casa. Welcome back home. As you know, we have been waiting for this moment, for this day, for a long time. Uh, last year, when other cultural and artistic institutions in New York were open, we couldn't be open. And I can tell you that me and my staff, we missed you. We missed our members. We missed our friends of the Casa as much as I think you missed us. And it's good to have you back. And uh, I couldn't think of a better event to restart our season, our mission, our work than this one. First of all, it's an event that has a beautiful title. We decided it in, during a brainstorming session and the, the title of the entire series that Ida Kayas is going to explain to you in detail is uh, Women, Women and the Renaissance. So there are all these elements here tonight and I take them as a good wish for the future that awaits us. First of all, the word Rinascimento is the rebirth, is the rebirth that we've been expecting for everything. And this is a sign of this rebirth. The women that we have on the stage tonight to, to talk, Ida that is going to introduce the series um, and is a Marie Curie fellow that has decided to uh, expand the range of her mission during her period of study, not only to her own study and to the preparation of the publications on which she's working, but also in the creation of these public events. The idea is that the Marie Curie Fellows, it's a very prestigious uh, fellowship that comes from the European Union, um, is not only for the people that receive it, but it's for the larger community. So it's very much like the mission of the Casa. Academia opens its doors, opens its windows, and makes what goes on inside the walls of the university available to anybody who has an interest, has a cultural curiosity to satisfy. So Ida Cagliazza brought to us this idea, we embraced it, and we are working together with her on it. And the other two women that are gonna be on the stage are two formidable women, and two Renaissance women, and two very, very good friends of the Casa and of mine personally. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna leave to Ida the, the, the job of introducing them formally, uh, but for both of them, I can say that their knowledge, their preparation on their subject is surpassed only by their humanity. That I have to say, it's another very key word to understand the Renaissance. And for those of us who have the fortune of having them as colleagues, it's a blessing to have them back on this day. So without further ado, I'd like to ask you to um, uh, welcome the person that is behind this series of events that we have created together. And I hope you will come to the future ones, the next ones, and that you will let people know that Casa is open and you can come and you can share and you can participate in our events. Again, welcome and thank you for being here with us. Please welcome Ida Kayata. Good afternoon, good afternoon everybody. Uh, I am uh, Ida Cagliazza, as Stefano said, I'm a uh, Marie Curie uh, Global Fellow at uh, the University of Oslo and uh, NYU, and I am delighted to welcome you here today as uh, this is uh, not only the opening event of the um, Casa Italiana season, but also the opening event of the US part of my global project. Uh, can I? Uh... Yeah. yeah, okay. Better. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, I wish to express my gratitude to the Department of Italian and to the Casa Italiana for hosting and uh, making possible uh, the series Love and Letters in the Renaissance. These uh, series are in fact the result of a close collaboration uh, between Stefano Albertini, the director of Casa Italiana, his collaborators uh, Julian Sachs, Costia Kostic and Chiara Basso, my wonderful supervisor Eugenio Refini, the department administrator Giulia Canziani and myself. Also, I'm honored beyond words uh, to have here uh, as guest speakers Professor Lina Bolzoni and Professor Jane Tylus, both incredible scholars of the Italian Renaissance, as you know, and as Stefano said, uh, long-time uh, contributors um, of the department and the Casa. 
Uh, moreover, they are not physically here, but have been fundamental in the conceiving and developing of my project. So I wish to thank also my other supervisors, Virginia Cox, who's current, currently at um, Trinity College, Cambridge, UK, uh, Un Falkeit at Oslo University, and Giovanni Tarantino at the University of Florence. And finally, I am uh, truly delighted to see so many of you here and online uh, which tells um, all of us how appealing and lively a culture uh, the italian renaissance is still today uh, thank you so much for being here on a friday afternoon after a full week of work and also heat and rain and uh, resisting the alluring and call of the weekend Okay, let's get started. Um, if you need the internet connection, you have the info here. For those of you who understand Italian, please note that the password is a random one, automatically generated by the NYU system, and we are not responsible for it. <laughs> Before leaving the floor to Lina Bolzoni and Jane Tyler, just a brief word about what's going to happen today. Uh, I will start with a two minute introduction about my project and the series Love Letters and the Renaissance. Then Professor Bolzoni will uh, lead us back to five centuries ago to the magnificent Renaissance Venice and the secret thoughts and sentiments of a cultured, well-read, quick-witted, brave woman, Maria Savorniano, of course, whose voice has been delivered to us today through a bunch of letters hidden for centuries, but then rediscovered in, uh, in an archive. After that, Professor Tylos will respond to Professor Bolzoni's speech, allowing us to continue our journey in Maria Savornian's mind, mind and writing. And finally, we will open to the audience and have a Q&A session. As you see, we'll stay here in the auditorium till 5 p.m. And then, and then we'll move to the courtyard where refreshments kindly offered by the Casa Italiana are already waiting for us. So I will start now with a few words about uh, the project and the series. The research program that kindly supports me is called Marie Curie uh, Global Fellowship and is granted by the European Commission Funds for Research. Uh, as for the subject of my research, my project's title is, as you see, Women Thinking Love, A Gender History of Emotions in Renaissance and Postrident in Italy, 1500-1650. Uh, the general purpose of the project is to explore women's ideas, practices, experiences, and fantasies of romantic love, thanks to the tools developed by the history of emotions. For instance, two of the words I just mentioned, experiences and fantasies, seem really innocent words, but when you look at them from the history of emotion uh, perspective, they become very complex uh, concepts and, of course, generate many scholarly discussions as you see here. My sources are the love letters exchanged and sometimes printed in Italy in the years 1500-1650, um, such as the two ones there. Um, yeah, And uh, in the ample context of the Women Thinking Love project, and thanks to the departments and the CASA's enthusiasm about these topics, we conceived the series Love and Letters in the Renaissance. Uh, the series focuses in particular on Maria Savornian, who wrote one of the most interesting set of love letters of the uh, 16th century. Uh, today, Lina Bolzoni is going to introduce the collection and its main features is going to outline Maria's profile, the emotional negotiation between Savornian and Bembo emerging from the letters, the way in which Bembo's ideas on love and literature were shaped by his dialogue with his lover. And she's also going to share quite interesting insights on how some 20th century scholars reacted to Maria's writing and behavior. Um, in a couple of weeks, uh, on September the 23rd, we're going to have here in person Marco Faini, the author of Bembo's biography, and Paola Ugolini, who specializes in Renaissance women and gender. Marco is going to focus on Pietro Bembo's intellectual and personal profile, as well as on um, the many women whom he had uh, intellectual exchanges with, uh, Maria Savornian, but uh, also Lucrezia Borgia, for instance. Uh, Paola instead is going to talk about the life possibilities that uh, Renaissance women had, depending on the various environments they lived in, the court, for instance, a noble family, an intellectual environment, and so on. 
Finally, uh, on the 30th of September, we're going to have online Paolo Procaccioli, who is the founder of a research group called Cinquecento Plurale, as you see there. Um, um, the object objective of Cinquecento Plurale is to explore the plurality of the 16th century beyond the mainstream and the classics. Um, among the uh, sources that uh, allow us to access the plurality of the 16th century, letter exchanges are of, of primary importance, also because they reveal what was behind the intellectual products of the Renaissance. Uh, Paolo Procaccioli is in fact also among uh, the leaders of another project called Archilet, aimed at um, mapping all the letter exchanges of the Italian Renaissance. The Archilet collaborators have done a great job so far, but nobody has proposed yet to add the filing and description of Maria Savornian's letters. So this is a call to action addressed to any scholar or student who thinks, as I do, that Savornian's voice deserves to be featured together with that of the other, usually male, letter writers already present in Archilet. In fact, after Bolzoni, Tylos, Faini, Ugolini and Procaccioli, I'm sure that by the end of this month we will have plenty of material and enough knowledge to do this. That's why on the 30th of September, after Procaccioli, I am meeting whomever is interested in this digital humanities project to plan the work together. Finally, if you want to know more about the Marie Curie funds and programs, we'll have a workshop on this on the 20th of October at the Italian department. Okay, um, I think I talked uh, enough already for now. Um, for any doubts or questions or anything you'd like to share, please drop me an email. You can find it, my, my uh, email in the NYU website. And now it's time to introduce our guest speakers. Um, Lina Bolzoni is Professor Emerita in Italian Literature at the Scuola Normale Superiore of Pisa and Global Distinguished Professor at New York University. She has collaborated with top institutions in France, uh, the United States, the UK and of course Italy. And she's a member of the Scientific Committee of the Istituto dell'Enciclopedia Italiana, a member of the Accademia dei Lincei and Fellow of the British Academy. Her research interests include the relations between literature and philosophy in the 16th and 17th centuries, uh, sacred and profane oratory, the art of memory and its relations with literature and the visual arts, as well as the experience of reading. She wrote several amazing books, which have been translated into different languages, including Japanese, for instance, which makes her a global ambassador of Italian Renaissance practically all over the world. Um, I will mention just a couple of them. The famous La Stanza della Memoria, published in 1995. Il Cuore di Cristallo, Ragionamenti d'Amore, Poesia e Ritratto nel Rinascimento, published in 2010. And last one, Una meravigliosa solitudine, L'arte di leggere nell'Europa moderna. Jane Tylus is professor of Italian and comparative literature at Yale University. She specializes in late medieval and early modern European literature, religion and culture with secondary interests in uh, 19th and 20th century fiction. Um, she has also been active in the practice and theory of translation. Her work is focused on the recovery and interrogation of lost and marginalized voices, historical personages, dialects and parole pellegrine minor genres such as pastoral, secondary characters in plays, poems, and epics. I'm sure we all know, for instance, her books on the secrets of Siena and on Caterina da, Sien da Siena, whose meaningful title is uh, Reclaiming Catherine, Catherine of Siena. Okay, now please join me in welcoming Professor Lina Bolzoni. It's great to be here again, <laughs> all together. So thank you very much to Ida, to Stefano, and uh, uh, to, to you who are here with us this evening. Uh, maybe we, we can begin with... No? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Okay. Oh. Thank you. 
Uh, this is a portrait by Memling, a portrait who maybe is the portrait of Pietro Bembo. Pietro Bembo was very young, was not yet the great cardinal, the great writer, uh, and so on. He was a young writer, and uh, uh, he was in love with Maria Savornian. And uh, we are discussing, as uh, Ida said, said uh, the letters, uh, the love letters that they exchanged between uh, 1500 and, uh, 50, and uh, 1501. And these letters have reached readers throughout the centuries with different timing and through different ways. This draws attention on some issues that scholarship has highlighted, that is, the complex relationship that women have uh, with print, the emergency in the 16 and uh, uh, in the 15 and 16th century of strong female personalities who show remarkable command of the literary and social code offered by patriarchism, and the fact that poetry can be adapted to a dialogical context and should consequently be considered through the framework in which it is situated. At the same time, it is interesting to consider the reactions of the scholars who read Maria's letters in the 20th century. Let, uh, uh, let's start by, the, by exactly this point. Carlo Dionisotti published the letters of Maria Savornian in 1950 so here we have the name of the two uh, persons who have been so important in rediscovering the letters. So Monsignor Luigi Grammatica, librarian at the Biblioteca Ambrosiana, and, as I said, Carlo Dionisotti. Carlo Dionisotti published the letters of Maria Savornian uh, alongside those of Bembo. As of today, Dionisotti's edition is the only one displaying together the voices of the two. Dionisotti starts from the work done by the scholar who found Maria's letters, Monsignor Luigi Grammatica, librarian at Ambrosiana. Dionisotti quotes the introduction prepared by Grammatica. A draft in pencil writing erased in many points from which we can grasp as in a fairy tale the pleasure of discovery. I quote, Quite some time ago, and under circumstances I could not precisely recall, while rummaging in a pile of sheets of paper already condemned to be burned and destroyed, I ran into a small set of yellowed sheets held together by a linen or hemp strand." End of quote. In this introduction, Monsignor Grammatica explained that it was a feminine and not too refined handwriting, with notes by Bembo. At this point, Grammatica effectively describes the dilemma he finds himself in. On one hand, he is fascinated by the spontaneity that characterizes the letters. They are perfectly authentic, he says, and the human nature in them does not strive to hide or dissimulates itself, end of quote. Grammatica is struck by the unexpected presence of Bembo. He recognizes his handwriting in the notes taken behind many of the sheets and understands that those letters allow to identify the previous unknown woman, the woman whose name is Whitehead, mentioned at the addresses of love letters included by Bembo in his Opera Omnia. And this allows, as he remarks enthusiastically, to reveal a double entry correspondence, correspondence to solve mysteries, to clarify obscure references. On the other hand, there is a remarkable, for him, moral obstacle, being the two in an irregular love relationship. The risk was to give a bad example, as well as, I quote, to reflect poorly on a public person, I, I mean uh, Bembo, 
however dead for four centuries. Grammatica decides to carry on his work anyway and to keep Maria's letters, fortunately, <laughs> which today are preserved in, at the Biblioteca Vaticana. Among the reasons which convince him to continue in this way, he includes the example offered by Bembo himself, who kept revising his own letters even when he was already a cardinal. Despite some hesitation, the letters to Maria were published no long after Bembo's death in the fourth volume of the letter in Venice in 1552. <coughs> it's striking that the modern editor of the correspondence, Dionisotti, also shows some reluctance. I quote, I did not immediately undertake the effort, he writes, because of an understandable lack of appetite for love stories, which intertwine with the history of literature, which have led to mistake the decorum of style for reality, or for the so-called sincerità degli affetti, authenticity of passions, end of quote. So we see that love letters, especially when written by a woman, are for Dionisotti a slippery ground, which is better kept on the margins of the history of literature. This is the way in which the love correspondence between Bembo and Maria Savornian comes to light, with uh, reluctance, moral dilemmas, theoretical doubts. Surely the two sets of letters differ profoundly. Savognan's texts are just the way they were written. They keep the freshness of the love message entrusted to the written words, which substitute for uh, the in-person dialogues and at the same time brings the conversation onwards. The written language is deeply influenced by the spoken language, by the dialect of the Veneto area, from the difficult relationship, for example, with the double consonants, to a vocabulary that insu insinuates itself even in the poems, such as the word sidio, novo mio sidio, sol mio sprone e freno, a dialect word meaning distress, torment. According to Enzo Quaglio, this is a sign of sprezzatura in a writer like Maria who commands the Petrarchan code. Or maybe, one could say, it's a sign of a language which, although being well aware of the new lyric code, is linked to spoken language and does not completely detach itself from the dialect. As I anticipated, the situation of Bembo's letter is very different. He revises and edits them, planning to print them, thus with a public circulation in mind. The text we read had been shaped into a more and more literary one. Bembo's last revision is witnessed by a manuscript of the Vatican Secret Archive. The manuscript represents the structure assigned by Bembo to the letters as early in 1535, that is, many years after the first draft. We can imagine he had taken Maria's letters, which could be compromising for her. Surely, not only he rewrote his own letters, but he also changed the dates in Maria's ones, in order to extend in time the duration of love, anticipating his beginnings. I think all this confers a unique taste to the correspondence we are dealing with. Bembo wants his own letters to be published, deeply rewritten and changed, ready to make a public appearance, even this only happens after his death. At the same time, he feels to urge to rewrite, in a sense, even Maria's letters, which remain unpublished, but he relocates them in time in order to reshape the features of their love exchange in his own terms to his own image and likeness. This was a peculiar way, unsettling in a sense, of taking possession of her personality, 
or at least to recreate her Fantasma Amoroso. For example, on August 3rd, he writes, concluding her letter, uh, I am in such terms that not one uh, hour passes in which I am not from its beginning to its end with the sweet thought of you. This is Maria's words. And Bembo adds, non fu finita, forse per non ma crescere tanta felicità. This was not finished, perhaps not to increase such great happiness. It's like if the dialogue with Maria continues also at the end of uh, the story. In the meantime, new research found out that Maria Savornian was not a married woman, but a widower. She was Maria Santagnolesca or Grifoni from Crema, who in 1487 married uh, a, a man from Friuli, Giacomo de Savornian. She lived in Venice and in 1498 was left a widow with four children. A provision in her late husband's will forced her to stay chaste and loyal to the husband, which explains why she and Bembo needed to keep the relationship secret and resort to ploys and tricks such as disguising coded messages, comedy situations. Thus, we are dealing with a strongly unbal uh, unbalanced letter exchange where the two protagonists appear in very different fashions. However, this correspondence is very evocative. It brings alive an extraordinary portrait of a woman in love who is capable of writing in verse and of using poetry to express her passion, to understand her inner itself. At the same time, the correspondence sheds a different light on the works of the young Bimbo, his poems, but especially his Azolani, the dialogues on love that are so closely intertwined with our letters. The Azolani accompany a variety of projects and experiences in Bimbo's life. Their beginning takes inspirations at the end of the 15th century from the end of a love story. And at the beginning of the new century, their writing is intertwined, as I mentioned, with the love for uh, Maria Savornian. And in uh, 1503 begins the love for Lucrezia Borgia, whom Bembo meets at the court of Ferrara, as Alfonso d'Este wife. And Lucrezia becomes the new dedicatee of, uh, uh, of the Azolani. Maria Savognan's letters are at the beginning of his story and help us to see the Azolani through different lenses. We understand, for example, that beyond the Compagnia degli Amici, the group of friends who appear in the dialogues, there is another important interlocutor, who is Maria Savognan. Furthermore, we realize that she plays a much more complex role than that of the beloved woman that is at the core of the love story and inspires its theoretical and literary transposition. Now, let's see what images of her emerges from the letters. Maria appears as the coordinator of the complex situation created by their love, as she is the one who is able to make the lover and contest possible, escaping Bernardino's uh, sur uh, surveillance a situation that is often recalled in the letters. Previously mistaken for her husband, recent scholarship has found out that he was a, trust, a trusted collaborator of Maria's brother-in-law, who was in charge of guaranteeing the honor of the household. Maria had literary interests, which were fully recognized and legitimized and she does not hesitate to take advantage of them. I quote, Bernardino, she writes, did not find out of your visit of yesterday. Thus, if you meet him, do not say anything to him. I will make him ask you, on my behalf, to lend me the Cento Novelle, is the Decameron, which you will then send through Camillo, end of quote. The lending of the Decameron, 
will thus help their encounters. But it is in the subsequent letter that she reveals her strategic skills, staging a true drama plot. Bembo is instructed to pretend to be in love with her handmaid Donata and to use as a go-between Menega, the wife of a neighbor. But things get complicated, the plots do not always succeed, suspicions grow stronger, sometimes misled, as Maria tells with satisfaction. And uh, the conclusion of the letter of the 5th of August, uh, Vostra sonne piace mi assai, I am yours, and uh, it pleases very much, as well as that of the letters dated uh, July uh, 20. Vostra sonne, vogliate o no, I am yours, whether you want it or not, show us that Maria speaks the language of passion transparently and with no restraints. Sappiate che giorno e notte altro che di voi non penso. Be aware that days at night I do not think but of you, she writes. Bembo's letters become an erotic object. The letters sent by him, I quote, won't complain about me because as soon as I read it, I kissed it more than, than, than 10 times, end of quote. In an equally passionate way, Bembo replies, thought delegating the narration to the night dream. During the night, I don't know if I have the text, okay, yes. During the night, I recall all the memories. I see you, I touch you, I embrace you, at length with incomparable delight. In my sleep, my, uh, my cheek gets so close to yours, and while I kiss your, your beautiful mouth, with timid daring, I clearly feel the sweet warm hot of our merged souls. It is interesting then in, uh, that in Maria's letters, there is no room for uncertainty or sense of guilt, that she always affirms strongly the value of the love she feels, even in difficult moments. For example, I quote, I will uh, love you as best I can, and I will always love you. And if I cannot have this love from you, I blame myself, who, recklessly running towards such an endeavor, wanted much and obtained little." End of quote. In fact, we do know that she took the initiative, the difficulties brought up by the situation and the plots and solutions she needs to find become for Maria an instrument of self-affirmation, a way to challenge a cruel destiny. I quote, I do not know what fortune plans to do with us. She might do as much as she can, but she will never prevent me from loving you. And if you will do the same, somehow we will meet one day so that her power won't be able to always impede our love, and she did in the past day, and still, as she did in the past day, and still does. But I hope that, proceeding, as I said before, we will win, and she will lose, exhausted. It's really a war against the, the fortune. And, uh, um, for example, in another passage, she quotes uh, a verse by, uh, by Petrarch, Triunfo d'Amore, and this is really impo important because the quotation for Petrarch are a part uh, of uh, the exchange of the letters, are part of the common literary and sentimental uh, code. And so, for example, we find the, the image of labyrinth, of labyrinth of love, or labyrinth of desperation. So, challenging the, uh, challenging the idea of challenging fortune and given the force implied and required by the difficult situation, Maria strives to transform this love into a paradigm, providing an example for future perfect lovers. Uh, for example, uh, Bembo says, the fire that burns me grows and becomes every day more beautiful, 
to the point that there is nothing it does not dare to reach through its eye flame. And if you want which draw, I see that will be an example for future love. So this is the idea that uh, their uh, love can be an example, an example of perfect, uh, of perfect love. Maria outlines the portrait of this perfect love using the common places of the lyric tradition. For example, the heart that stays in the beloved, the link between love and death, and she projects in a pagan afterlife the dream of an eternal cont continuation of their love. I quote, uh, even thought we left, my heart did not leave you, were the light of my eyes, without which my life would be for me more bitter than death. Thus, since the very existence of my life depends on you, red soul, please, I beg you to burn just the same, till time will lead us to the Elysian fields, where I also hope to live happy with the sweet memories and in talking of you and with you, writing and collecting beautiful flowers." End of quote. Here we find some of the key points of the correspondence. Maria writes, Ardendo di pari, burning equally. Di pari, equally, is a light motif introduced by her and recalled by him in different happy or unhappy moments. But di pari not only requires an equal emotional involvement, but also a peer position in the Tolkien and writing projected by Maria in the eternal afterlife of the Elysian fields. What strikes in the correspondence is Maria's strong personality. As a reader, she is capable, as Bembo, of resorting, as I said, to the treasure of poetical tradition, most Petrarchan, to find the words which will allow her to express her love. The common knowledge of Petrarch's poetry is in fact one of the main features of the correspondence. We have mentioned earlier that a line of Petrarch's Triunfo d'Amore is quoted by Maria while emphasizing the greatness and the difficulties of her love. The same line is recalled in Bembo's letter, first to confirm its content and then to underline that the situation has a change. Petrarch, as we have seen, functions as a shared code, but Maria shows to be an attentive reader, not only of Petrarch's poems. We mention her asking to borrow the Decameron, but the letters as are mostly intertwined with the Azolani, whose writing is close in time to this correspondence. Ben was a member of the group of friends of Maria's family. His presence in the house and his readings of the book he was writing, precisely the Azolani, was accepted and approved. Maria takes advantage of this to create occasion for love encounters. And uh, it's a, there is another uh, interesting uh, um, reference, for example, to the literary tradition. Uh, Galeotto fu il libro e chi lo scrisse. Uh, for example, uh, in a certain moment, uh, Bembo says, più dolci pensieri sono stati meco che io da voi mi dipartì, che non erano quello degli inglesi amanti, dei quali si ragionò fra noi. After I left you, I was accompanied by thoughts sweeter than those of the English lovers. Of course, it's a, a memory of Dante. Uh, whom we talk about together. Maria is fascinated by the fact that her lover is a writer and a poet, and she supports his writings, even when this prevents them for, from meeting. Full of admiration for the literary works of her lover, Maria, in other aspects, considers herself his peer. Their love game includes both poems by her and her critical remarks on his poems, which suggestion for revisions, Bimbo is the one who takes the initiative, and he does it as a love homage to her. 
Maria is asked to intervene on lines that behind inspired by her are actually her, uh, her own. And uh, uh, Maria replies postponing everything uh, till when they will be able to meet. Uh, I quote, how could I uh, be skilled enough to amend and polish your poems? Of course, I will trust your words, O oh flatterer. And how? Who am I, you or enough? Uh, we will talk about this in person. Bimbo will refer to the image of the Lima literary file, an emblem of the polishing work, which will be defined as uh, sweet in a context which Maria's commitment to revise his poems seems to mean that she won't leave, after all, Venice, or that she will comfort him. Perhaps, Bimbo writes, you have uh, already left, and uh, I quote uh, the uh, translation, of the mentioned canzone, I send you the little I have craft, which is one stanza. And so I will proceed from now on, sending you the single parts while I write them, which, if you will amend and polish through the sweet file, Lima, of your mind, I am sure that it will be either prevent you from leaving or offer me so much comfort and peace that somehow I will further tolerate the intolerable sorrow of your absence. If you want to amend it, you can delete every single error in it through burning it. It too won't be displeased by being killed like this by you since even his author is not displeased by seeing that you have prepared for him a similar death, and giving this death to a paper sheet won't be a burden to you, since you want to give it to me and is not a burden." End of quote. The mentioned stanza of the canzone follows, and here the amendment that Maria is asked to make in his lies is part of Bembo's metaphoric game, offering a variation on the topic of burning love and of death for love. The woman will burn the paper in order to eliminate the errors of the stanza. The stanza is identified with the paper on which it's written down, and thus in turn generates an analogy with Bembo's body and soul, which will both die being far from the beloved woman. For Maria too, the critical reading of Bembo's poetry, in a research in difficult moments of their love, I quote, I have lost my audacity. Do not expect your canzone from me. I was too daring. I beg your forgiveness. This is because I loved too much. But in other moments, she chose to proceed de pari, to be on an equal level as is, to the point of criticizing in a canzone his style, which is seen by her as too flowering for, for the everyday subject of the poem. So Maria shows to be a sharp reader, capable of keeping her clarity of mind in spite of her love, referring to the Petrarchan code, which requires a correspondence between subject and style. Perhaps the canzone is about her, and thus her discourse could be interpreted as modest. And uh, it's uh, important that she, uh, she also writes, uh, writes poem, and we find these poems uh, uh, among, uh, among her, uh, uh, her letter. Um, for example, we, we find uh, a sonnet, we find two strambotti, uh, by Maria. The first one invites the spirit of gentile, kind soul of the beloved to be wisely slow, l'andara passo passo, piano piano, e natura e costuma di, uh, di prudente. And it is introduced by a peculiar astrological remark and by an expression of modesty by Maria, as she has felt the need for an anticipated self-defense. I quote, this strambotto was delivered to me last Friday, but as a, a, an eclipse occurred on this day, I decided not to send it to you. 
and also because it was not worth on being seen by your eyes. However, I give you little pleasure and to bother you with my blattering. I, uh, I send it now. So she, she sends a strambotto, she sends a barzelletta, she, uh, she sends other, other verses. So even in the verge of a crisis, Maria wants to keep a poetical correspondence with Bembo. It is interesting here and also later, how poetry is accompanied by music and singing. As far as we know, Bembo refused to write a barzelletta, as uh, Maria asked, but as a compensation, he transcribed in his note the beginning of Maria's barzelletta. In a previous happier moment, Bembo had written to her, Io non posso dire quanta gioia me ogni verso. There are no words to express how much joy I received from any single line of yours. And uh, on, uh, fourth, uh, on January 4th, uh, this is how he reproaches her. I quote, who could have believed, knowing the love you once showed to me, that you could have refrained for so long from writing even a single line to me. If, on one hand, the little canzoniere by Maria Savornian, I mean the poems that she uh, puts in, uh, in the letters, has been rediscovered, uh, on the other hand, I believe that those poems should be considered in the rich context in which they are included. In this correspondence featuring the exchanged gifts, for example, the puppy, the gloves, and most of all, the portrait, which many lyric variations are based upon. The portrait, once again, allows Maria to express his desire in spite of everything. Vi mando il retratto, che non sta bene, pur vi lo raccomando. I send you my portrait, which is not good. Nevertheless, I entrust it to you. We also see appear on stage those who act as witness, as accomplices, as confidence of the love story, a rich and varied Compagnia degli Amici, company of friends, as will be called the small academy founded by Bembo and his friends in the first years of the 15th century while writing the Asolani. Apart from delivering to us an unforgettable portrait of a woman, Maria Savornian's letter makes us think about Renaissance love poetry, about its close link to objects and images, about its dialogical nature, about its capacity of expressing and shaping a social context. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lina, so much for the wonderful lecture. And now it's time for Jane's response. Ah, great to take this off. Sorry, you need to leave yours on. Um, well, thank you so much, Lina, for that wonderful talk. And I, I just have to say how Terrific it feels to be back here in a place I love and have loved for two decades um, with old friends like Lina Bolzoni and Stefano Albertini and new friends uh, like Ida, the wonderful Ida, who's brought us all together today. So again, such a treat and a pleasure for me to be back here and hope to continue in a post-COVID era uh, to return as often as I'm invited. Um, so it's with some shame that I want to start out by admitting <clears throat> that this is the first time I've read these extraordinary letters of Maria Savornian, and I couldn't put them down once I started. It's as though we'd found Lauda's letters to Petrarch or Beatrice's letters to Dante. Um, you know, assuming that they loved these guys, which they probably didn't, but you know, we'll never know. Um, and I and I have to confess too that it wasn't it wasn't easy for a non-native speaker of Italian to plow her way through these seventy-seven epistles, um, given. Maria's idiosyncratic grammar, her extensive use of the Venetian dialect, her love at coining words that not even her first editor that Lena mentioned, Carlo Dionizotti, um, could always fathom. Indeed, as Lena has just mentioned, 
Uh, Maria is acutely aware of the new lyric vernacular. She knows her Petrarch, but at the same time, her writing remains literally impregnated. That's a word that Lena was using actually in Italian by her spoken language, a language that doesn't in any way remove itself from her dialectal local Venetian roots. Bembo, not surprisingly, the vastly educated Bembo is a more fluid and affluent read. He's already looking to his 14th century models, Dante et Petrarca Boccaccio, with respect to both his poetry and his prose. And as he writes Maria Savornian in that turbulent summer of 1500, when the vast majority of these letters were composed, there are some 30 of Maria's 77 letters were written just in the month of August. He's already thinking of his Prose della Lingua Vulgare, that great manual as how to write in Italian. As Lena put it in her wonderful book, which Ida has already mentioned, Una Mervigliosa Solitudine, Bembo's search for a form of writing that might reveal one's spirit, his animo, is only a stage in a journey that was wrong from the start. Uh, one needs models, so, so does Bembo say. Uh, one needs pedagogical rules, the discovery of the giusti maestri, or the right teachers, so one can conform one's style to others. One sh you shouldn't always be looking for your own style, in other words, and this is what comes out of Bembo's uh, later manual. There's a fear in Bembo that his own ricerca di se, his search for himself, will lead him astray into dangerous waters, perhaps the waters of his affair with the widowed Maria Sorvignan, rife as it is with the daily threats of being discovered by a guardian or a brother-in-law whose sole purpose in life seems to be to enforce that dead husband's will that his widow will never remarry. And this at a time when Bembo was still hoping to land himself a pretty influential post in Venetian government, hopes he will soon relinquish when he leaves for Ferrara shortly after breaking up with Savonian. And yet the prose, again, this, 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 this text about the, the proper uses of the vernacular, with their insistence on following Petrarch and Boccaccio and on the superiority of writing to speech, uh, these words don't appear officially until 1525. And a quarter of a century earlier, those turbulent days of August 1500, they were just an idea, maybe an idea inspired by Maria's own vivacious, energetic involvement with Italian, as the classicist Bembo, that expert in Latin and Greek, comes to recognize the necessity of the, and the importance of this other language, so vital to his life and that of others, like his beloved. Was he ultimately sensitive to the need of reigning in his love and the language expressed so forcefully by Maria Savignan? Or was he impressed by what comes across even to, to me, this non-Italian, as the exceptional power, the raw energy behind Maria's letters? Some of them a single sentence or two arranging a tryst or warning against a planned meeting because it has suddenly become too dangerous. Others of her letters go into the anguishing details of Savignan's poor health, no doubt exacerbated by the uncertainties of this new love venture. And yet still other letters recount in no uncertain terms her, uh, her criticism of the young Bembo's verses. On several occasions, as Lena notes, she invokes the Horatian polishing stone, the file or the lima, to inform Bembo that, you know, this poem just isn't ready for circulation. It needs work. In this furious exchange of epistles, sometimes as many as three or four in a single day, just, you just imagine Bembo's servants, you know, running back and forth between the two houses. Um, how is, you know, Bembo perhaps becoming aware of the imminent, intimate, resonant force of the lingua vulgare that this 30-year-old Bembo, having what seems to be only his second serious romantic fling in 30 years, um, you know, and, 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 and a vulgare that contains passionate expressions such as vostra, vostra, e vostra, e vostrissima son, e sero sempre. I'm yours, I'm yours, I'm yours, I'm really yours, and I will be forever. So how did this just both excite him and kind of unnerve him? This is where Lena, I think, is heading too, as she suggests the extent to which Bembo was in search of philosophical traditions that would help give new dignity to the tradition of the vulgare. At the same time, if Maria's Venetian may not be the model at which Bembo would soon be pointing, there may be something to her constant insistence on her and Bembo's love as serving as an esempio aliamanti, an example to lovers, as a model of a different kind, not in a linguistic way, but in a personal way, as Lena also observes. For this man who would go on to discourse of the highest love in Castiglione's courtier, or in his Azolani, the book to which Maria refers a few times in the course of their correspondence, there was no doubt something to thinking about using his own life and experiences in love as a resource for his writing. But did Maria have that idea before he did? 
In 2012, and I don't have it on a slide for you, but I can show you the actual object of uh, this book, um, Monica Faretti's edition of Savonian's letters appeared with ample notes and a suggestive introduction. One of the important things about her book is that it puts the emphasis on Savornian herself. We only get her letters and not Bembo's. And the absence of his letters, rewritten, rethought, rearranged, finally published only after his death, makes her stand out on her own as the forceful personality she seems to have been. And while we can't fully understand her letters without Bembo, I would never want to claim that, a Bembo who sought, as we've heard, to rearrange her letters in the file that was recovered in the 20th century, and who may also have removed some of her letters from that file in the process, there's something key in attempting to see Maria in a different light, against a different backdrop, women's written legacy. The focus, indeed, of the series which, which Ida has put together here at NYU. Lena suggests that Maria never shows any sense of uncertainty or guilt despite her rather awkward situation. I'm particularly struck by Lena's comparison of Maria to a regista or a director, which brings us overtly to a Maria in control, confident in her moves and showing us someone who's really running the show and writing the canovaccio or the script. I'm reminded here maybe a bit selfishly of an article I wrote some years ago called Women in the Windows, in which I talked about the frequent use in the Commedia dell'arte as well as in the Commedia erudita of the Cinquecento, of a trope in which women characters prohibited in classical theater from acting on the public stage could get around that prohibition by appearing from a window upstage uh, and often running things from that high on perch. What I didn't sufficiently appreciate at the time and what I have only really recognized like now is that the finestra or the window is one of the main strategic points through which real women not actresses, not characters, had access to the outside world, whether to talk to one another, you know, shouting over the laundry lines, um, or to plot and arrange their assignations, as did Maria. Uh, Por venite questa sera e vi parlerò dalla finestra. Uh, so does she say to Bembo, right? You can come tonight and I'll talk to you through the window. Uh, she writes this to Bembo on August 5th. The next day, though, she's chewing him out. Um, uh, as we'll see, uh, because he's let himself be seen. As she says, bene vete fatto a lasciarvi vedere, right? That was really great, you let yourself get seen, right? So again, we get this constant sense of the role of the window in her own life. There's even one frantic moment where her guardian finds the cord that provided the scala or the ladder on which Bembo would climb through the window at night to get to Maria's bed. But more frequently, she sets up various assignations from the window so she can give others directions, often Bembo's own messengers and confidants. It's these daily details that give these letters such life. We can kind of see Bembo climbing up the slippery rope. And a reference to the cavana or the boathouse where they're scheduling another encounter lets us imagine a calm summer night off the Grand Canal where they're either waiting for the traghetto that will carry them off to you know, have their tryst on the boat, or maybe they're just planning to hang out in the cavana itself. In each case, it's Maria who provides the directives showing us, or at least showing me, that this is not about a theatrical world. This is the real world from which theater would take its cue. When placing Maria into the context of women, Lena has argued how critical it is to think about both that literary context and what she calls the more social, immediate context. Farnetti, in the edition I just showed you, mentions the poet Gaspara Stampa, also Venetian, as an heir of Savarnian's, and I couldn't agree more even if Maria's lyric output is very limited when you think about Stampa's 309 poems. Here, Maria shows herself to be faithful to the Petrarchan vocabulary, while she's not shy about focusing on her own amorous situation or lack thereof, as when in her final moving sonnet, Maria refers to the flame which once burned so strongly but now has dwindled and is about to be distinguished, in some ways a very anti-Petrarchan move. Is this preparation for her moving on in the same way that Gaspar Stampa would refer to herself as the salamandra or the salamander who lives in flame and who can go on to another flame when and as needed. Among the other women that Farnetti mentions in her introduction as, a, as part of this female legacy, one in particular stands out, as surprising as she might be, Eloise or Heloise, the lover of Abelard, who bore his child and was then consigned by him to spend the rest of her life in a convent. And I'd be curious, Lena, what you might think about these comparisons and how we might best fit Maria within this tradition of women's writing, and if so, which traditions in particular. 
There's something ironic about the fact that Maria is supposed to be fedele or faithful to her husband's memory. This husband, with whom she had four children, is never once mentioned in the letters despite his fairly recent death. And with one important exception, neither are her four children. This is where thinking about issues of gender and the social dynamics of early modern Italy become for me especially complicated and even poignant. The one epistle in the collection that is not addressed to Bambo, although it seems that he wound up with it and possibly even delivered it, is from Maria's time in Ferrara. After she was sent there, perhaps as a way of minimizing the damages that life in Venice as a widow might inflict on the family name. From Ferrara, where she arrived by January of 1501, so as six short months after that incredible exchange of letters in July and August, she writes to her adoptive mother one of the longest epistles in this collection. Her children have clearly been left in Venice, the oldest of whom can't have been more than 12. The one, and perhaps it seems, only living creature for whom Maria was now responsible in Ferrara has just died, the dog Benbino. In fact, she says, non fate come noi che abbiamo perso bambino, uh, Benbino, so don't do what I did because we killed the dog. We can only guess at what this separation from her family cost her. She promises to come home, and yet on the other hand, she promises to come home soon after the Festa of San Giorgio, yet seems to have delayed that return by at least a month. And elsewhere in the letters, um, while still in Venice, she refers to the women who would occasionally keep her company on some of these long Venetian evenings as certe altre pazze, certain other crazy people. How much was she really missing Venice? Someone who refers to her own inquieto stato or restless state, Maria Savornian, the person who had a life before Bembo and presumably one after him, is also able to calmly accept the extinguishing of the flame. She will move on, even as she says in the last line, a voi mirar non, lire, non lice alto da terra, right? It's not really permitted for me to look up at you from the earth. So elevated is Bembo above herself. At the same time, we must contrast the Petrarchan inflected largely balanced poems, a balance Stampa will notably upset through her content and Veronica Franco through her form, uh, with her comparatively, with Maria's comparatively unmeasured prose. I've abandoned Bembo and just want to start the Q&A with perhaps one question about him, one that I think uh, that Lena has effectively already answered, but I'd like to hear a little more. What did Maria Savarnian manage to bring out in him that perhaps then gets shut down or shut out after their intense affair ends? Is there something unique in his letters to her different from the rest of his carteggio or correspondence? And did he in turn prompt letters from other women as moving as Maria's? He too would go on, as we've already heard, to other windows. Or as he says to Lucrezia Borgia a year after his affair ends with Savarnian, often I find myself recalling certain words spoken to me, some on the balcony with the, with the moon to witness, others at that window, which I shall always look upon so gladly. And Lord Byron in the 19th century would call Lucrezia Borgia's epistles, quote, the prettiest love letters in the world. Does and must the trail always lead back to Bembo? Or are we justified in seeking out what Farnetti and Dacia Marini and others have called a sorelanza, a sisterhood, grounded in their particular love for reality, and what Lena refers to as Savornian's realism about the difficulties that she faced and overcame, as well as her use of poetry to express her real passion? Or perhaps finally, this is the wrong question, if all roads must lead to Bembo. As Lena points out, uh, Maria and Bembo seek constantly to move di pari, to move equally, to move together. And in a very real sense, given that they inspired each other, Bembo's letters and verses may be considered as much Maria's as his own. Can we consider their writings at best a collaborazione, a collaboration? One which is finally belied by the last verse of Maria's last letter. She indeed dared to look up from the earth to the sky, as we see in these wonderful poems and these wonderful epistles. Thanks to Lena, thanks to <laughs> Stefano, thanks to Ida for this opportunity.
Ok. Sì. So it's time for the Q&A session now. Lina, do you want to start? Um, uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, I'd like to thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Jane. It's a great uh, lecture. <laughs> and uh, I, I hope that uh, it will be possible in the future to write something together because <laughs> it's a... Uh, and I am so glad that Maria Savornian <laughs> became visible after <laughs> so long time. And uh, about, uh, I would like only uh, to say very briefly one thing, and I hope that there, are, there will be a discussion, because uh, uh, the questions that you pose are very, very interesting. Uh, first of all, about uh, the edition of the letters, because uh, uh, I, I appreciated very much uh, Monica Farnetti's edition, because uh, uh, is, is important. Uh, she uh, she's as you said uh, has a, a very strong um, sensibility for uh, gender studies and so on. And uh, uh, now we have two modern editions, but they are separated. I mean, we have Monica Fernetti editions of Maria's letters, and we have a new critical edition by Trevi of Bembo's letters. The problem is put them together again after the Odisotti, after the new sensibility for gender studies, and also with some difficulties, because it's not easy, uh, as uh, we see in the Odisotti's edition, uh, to find exactly the chronology, because Bembo rewrites also Maria's letters. So it's a very challenging uh, question. and. Uh, also, uh, it, of course, uh, it's so, Maria has a, a so strong personality. It's very modern. I don't know if, uh, uh, if it depends, of course, of her, but also because we have the beginning of the 16th century, maybe after the, uh, with the counter-reformation, I mean, later, I don't know if also in a private letter, how woman could find uh, the power, could find the, the force of confessing her passions in, uh, in this way. So it's a very interesting position. And I'd like to remember uh, that we, we read uh, her letters as, a, uh, as an Italian text, but as, uh, but, uh, uh, as Eugenio knows, we, uh, we read uh, in a seminar to Scuola Normale the letters of Maria, and there was a great student, Matteo Residori, who now is, is professor at Paritrua, and Matteo uh, comes from Verona. And this was wonderful because he was reading Maria's letter, not like, like us, but with <laughs> the Veneto, <laughs> and it's so different. Really, we are before Prose la Vulgar Lingua. Uh, so it's interesting also if we think of this. And uh, it's not easy to, to understand everything in Maria's letters, because uh, uh, there are some dialects, uh, but not only. It's a, a very complicated love story. She's a great regista. <laughs> So the situation is uh, full of secrets, of uh, elements that are not easy to, to understand. But OK, uh, so thank you very much. I hope that there will be a discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane, for your uh, speech um, and for your uh, reply, Lina. Are there any questions or comments from the audience? Yeah. Okay. I just must know: Was their love ever consummated, and if, and why did it end? <laughs> because love ends. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, was was it? Uh, yeah, I think that it was a really uh, passionate love. It seems to understand. Yes. Oh, sorry. What? 
you know, so at the moment, <laughs> love ends. <laughs> we don't know why. <laughs> it was very intense, very for yeah. one season. In fact, there's a reference. Uh, oh, sorry. It's also incredible that you, you can imagine Pietro Bembo was a cardinal, a very important cardinal, and he decided to, to publish his, not her, his love letters. So it's a very, very interesting. Was it compromising for him and for her? It's a compromising? Was it a compro just a compromising for her? No, she was dead. <laughs> it, would be, it would be compromising for him, but he didn't care. Was it before he became a priest? Yes. But the problem is that he, I mean, he, uh, he had uh, lovers until the end of his life. So he continues to, to have love affair, but he became cardinal. <laughs> okay, so. He could have love affairs in his private life. But you understand that to decide to publish his uh, letters, love letters, he says that uh, it was, uh, uh, I mean, there were from uh, when he was young, <laughs> a lot of time ago. Any other questions or comments? With regards to in this topic, the, the correction, the editing that uh, Bimbo does, both of his letters, and you said also of uh, Savonian, was done, the edit. Does he Correct edit you? also the letters of Maria? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not exactly correction, but some notes, <laughs> some notes and comments. And sometimes they are very, very moving. Uh, for example, in a certain moment when uh, she, she says, uh, I love you so much, uh, and uh, uh, he, he writes, and uh, uh, she, she ends here, uh, uh, her letter, because uh, it was too much. <laughs> There's a kind of commentary of the letters. And the edits to his own letters are only like to take away the, the parts or to be more uh, explicit in the description of the love affair, or there are other kinds of edits, of self-edits, to his own letters? No, no, the, the letters by Maria. Ah, we don't know. We don't know because uh, we, have, we, have not, we have not the first, the first letters, the real, <laughs> the real letters. We have only uh, the, yeah, the edited letters. So we can suspect that <laughs> there were some. Uh, Hi, I was just wondering um, to that point about the the, the edits and uh, so articulating that with Jane's question about what these letters brought out in Bembo, and this would be speculative, but I wonder if one can speculate if Bembo's original letters perhaps were more dialectal and that then the editing process would have been this process of, of correcting it in a way that um, yeah, perhaps also speaks to this suppressed erotic dimension that Jane was speaking to. And obviously, we don't have the originals, so it's difficult to answer that question, but it's tempting to think about it along those terms, and I was just wondering what you thought about that. No, Lena, you're much better suited <laughs> to answering. Uh, which is your point? Do you mean uh, uh, how how Bembo wanted to revise his letters? Would right, you, and we don't have the original, so it's difficult to know for uh, sure. We can exactly. only imagine. We can only imagine, right? Exactly. So it's a speculative <laughs> maybe, question. Maybe also the originals were more closer to the dialect. That's maybe. right. Exactly. That's that was my maybe. Yeah. yeah. Right, we have at the beginning. We have the beginning of the 16th century. Right, right. If we think of Azolani, okay, the, uh, I mean, the way of writing of Bembo, it uh, is very distant from the dialect, but mm -hmm. we don't know. Maybe it was also a kind of more familiar language. Yeah. It's difficult. Something like <laughs> Maybe Ala you, you can find the original somewhere, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and we can find an answer <laughs> to our curiosity. <laughs> Any other questions? 
for uh, joining. Yes, uh, thank you all for. Uh, I don't need the mic. Yes, okay, it's then let go. Thank you. Um, thank you for um, the talk and thanks for the um, response, Jane. Uh, it's been so really mind blowing um, and really it's very happy to be back here and have a live conversation. Uh, this is just a treat. Um, the kind of question which I have is really um, about the notion of authorship because in a way, and I think Jane's final point was going in this direction, to what extent can we think about these um, epistolary interaction as the result of a double authorship or a common authorship. And this kind of question made me think more broadly about the epistolary genre in general, which is so interesting because of course we do have real letters which get to be edited and published as is the case with uh, Bembo and many others. Um, we have the example of later on um, epistolary novels where letters are invented from scratch, often giving voice to both interlocutors. So we have one person taking care of writing letters for both. Uh, but when we have two people involved, as is the case with Maria and Bembo, inevitably, every single bit of the story is the result of a conversation, right? Because they are answering and replying to each other. And so I'm thinking that the philological question about how to present these materials, the idea of bringing them back together, um, has a relevance also in terms of thinking about what it means to be the author or the authors of an epistolary corpus. And I think you know this is one of the questions which Ida is also asking more broadly in her project. And this is so thought provoking because really it sort of reshapes our idea of what a, an exchange of letters is uh, when we do have two or more people involved in the process. Yeah, you are right. I mean, it is, it's a very peculiar situation because uh, uh, it's difficult also uh, to, uh, to forget that, okay, we have Bembo, we have this great uh, personality, and you say, and uh, we have this Bembo because it's the Bembo of the last year revising the test. But we have also a kind of double person because it's the, it's the Bembo revising the text and the, and the young Bembo writing a different text. And of course, I was, uh, I was thinking, uh, okay, if, uh, if we think of Gaspar Sampa or other women, uh, the situation is different because uh, uh, they, uh, Gaspar Stampa, other, uh, were, they published, they published uh, their poems, uh, they were known. Here, we, we, try, <laughs> we are trying to rediscover something that was not uh, published. So the, the relationship from a literary point of view between the two who write letter <laughs> is, so, is so different. The difference is so strong that it's a, it's a peculiar situation. Uh, so it's, it's interesting because uh, uh, there is uh, an attempt uh, to uh, to create a situation that is, I mean, when Maria tries to suggest some corrections to Bembo, she tries to, to forget the difference. But it's only a very private question. And usually, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't do what she, she suggests. <laughs> so it's a, it's a very peculiar situation. But you are right. The, the problem of the authority of, uh, I mean, of uh, the quality of the, ex uh, the exchange of letters is very, is very different from uh, other examples. I don't know if, uh, yeah. uh, if Jane, do you want to add something? No, I'll just, I'll just, you know, what you said just now, Eugenia, reminds me of just a little pedantic date fact, um, which is October of the year that these two were having their uh, their get-togethers. Um, 
the first edited collection of letters in, a, in the vernacular language comes out in Venice around the corner from the boathouse where they're hanging out um, by the press of Aldo Manuzio, and they're the letters of Capone of Siena. Um, whether Bembo and, I mean, Bembo was quite close to Manuzio, so it's quite possible that Bembo you know, was aware of this publication. Maria, who knows? I'm not suggesting there was any kind of influence of Catherine of Siena on these two lovers, but I'm just, I just, you know, I, I do think it's an interesting point to be thinking about the extent to which at this very moment, strangely enough, just simply as pure coincidence, no doubt, um, this other very forceful female voice was being acknowledged by the great humanist printer Aldo Manuzio, who had to that point only published works in Greek and Latin. So this interesting shift that's taking place in the epistolary conversation, as it were, in Venice, um, you know, the move in Manuzio's case from Greek and Latin, humanist, classics, men, to this one female voice that was just about as strong as Maria Savarnian's, very differently, but but equally powerful. It's just it's just kind of a coincidence I wanted to remark on. And also just to pick up on your on your point about the extent to which we need to see these letters as in sync that we need to see, you know, we can't read Bembo without Savarnian and vice versa. We have to be thinking about perhaps Bembo's works as a kind of, yeah, as a kind of collaboration. Um, why isn't her name more prominent uh, in terms of the editions of Bembo's works now, as we are at this new moment that Ida is going to be carrying into the future? <laughs> um, uh, just one second. I, w I just wanted to add something um, following up uh, Eugenio's question. Um, this is a really important uh, question uh, from a methodological point of view. And I uh, just wanted to add that, oh, sorry, that we have um, a really interesting example of um, what you were mentioning uh, in the second half of the 16th century is the um, love letter collection, the Libri di Lettere Amorose by Alvise Pasqualigo. Um, some scholars think that they are the first epistolary novel, the first, the first mod modern epistolary novel of Italian literature. Um, and um, the question of authorship, uh, it, it's really important for this um, uh, book because in, uh, in the first version, um, the curator, Francesco Sansovino, says that it is a real um, correspondence um, that was um, brought to um, the uh, uh, officina, uh, the, the printing, um, uh, the, the place where um, the typography, mm? and uh, they were uh, published as they had been written, just um, uh, deleting the very compromising points. And of course, they were anonymous in the first place because uh, the uh, lovers were still alive so their identities needed to be protected. But then, um, some years uh, after, uh, Francesco Sansovino publishes, publishes them again with the name of the male author uh, and in this second uh, version he claims that um, they are uh, fiction. Uh, so he contradicts himself and uh, creates a literary case. Uh, before, he had created a gossip case, but in the second version, a literary case. So the authorship question in this um, field is really is really an important one. Um, there was a question there. I'm wondering if I could ask a double question, and one for Lena and, and for Jane. Um, uh, one, one thing is that Bembo had to have a copy of his letters that he sent to Maria de Savignon in order to revise them, which would suggest that he, I mean, he was already in this passionate relationship, he's nonetheless making copies of his letters. Uh, or we just don't know where these, where these original copies came from. But she may have presumed that they were going to be published at some point. So in some ways, there may have already been a kind of literary collaboration, but perhaps her letters might not be published, but his letters to her would be. And that's one of the things that she may be partly uh, uh, working on. I, 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 but I guess my larger question is really about what happens to Petrarchism here, where Petrarchan poetry is about writing to the lady whom you cannot ever obtain and whom you finally really wouldn't want to obtain because your own emotions are more interesting, finally, it's an, uh, to, to discuss. 
What happens here with Bembo? I mean, Bembo really seems to change this discussion. And what does the mutuality, what does the fact that this is a consummated love affair do to the tradition of Petrarchan poetry? David, if I understand, you think that uh, the letters by Maria were copied by Maria? No, that the Bembo must have kept copies of the letters to her in order to revise them. Ah, okay. Therefore, she might have already thought that these were letters mm -hmm. that would eventually be published. It's not clear how the situation is. But uh, the, because it's not clear how uh, these letters uh, came uh, to be rediscovered. Uh, but uh, one of the hypotheses is that uh, the uh, letters of Maria were, um, I mean, that Bembo had the letters from, uh, from Maria. And uh, um, the, the other question is about uh, Ah, oh, well, Petrarch. But it seems to me that uh, the, uh, the, the use of Petrarch is it's a use of fragment. I mean, it's like a, a rewriting, no? It's, it's like a, a depository of uh, verses uh, that you can use for different situations. It's a kind of dictionary <laughs> the, of topoi. So it's, uh, it's a, it seems to me that uh, this is basically the, the use of, uh, it's not, uh, uh, an, uh, I mean, there is no problem of interpretation of Petrarch. You are right, we are very, low. <laughs> it's very different situation in Petrarch and this kind of, uh, of use of Petrarch. But uh, uh, it's a different problem, but I would like to, uh, to remind that uh, there is uh, the passage that, has, uh, that I quoted about the idea of a dream in the afterlife. And it's interesting because uh, she says that when she dreams this wonderful afterlife with Bembo, she, they, they will uh, uh, not only discussing, but also writing together. <laughs> so it's, you know, I wonder, where's her husband and all that, right? <laughs> Isn't she technically supposed to hang out with him in the Elysian Fields? <laughs> right. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. It's a very thing. No, exactly. That's, that's wonderful. I hadn't thought about that. Um, right, right. No, the husband is just totally effaced as is Dante's wife. No, it's, it's, it's really true. So it's really interesting to see to see that move being made by, by, by Maria Savarnian as well. And, you know, David, I, I think that I love that question about what happens to Petrarchismo. I, you know, it just made me, th I started thinking like, well, what are the great canzonieri of the 16th century? And, you know, Vittoria Colonna's marriage was consummated. And then, of course, her husband dies. So that gives a very different inflection. I mean, you have Della Casa, who, like Garspa de Stampa, moves on from one beloved to another in his shorter lyric sequence. Stampa, after 200 sonnets to Colaltino, takes up with somebody else. Um, so this fracture in, in the Petrarchan narrative, I think, is really, is really fascinating. And I, I hadn't really been giving much attention to what Bembo's role is in this. But it's clear that something very different is happening here with his, with his work as well. And um, the fact that Savonian seems to be so influential on the, his articulation of that vocabulary very, very early in his career is still something that clearly needs to be acknowledged here. Um, so thanks, really. I'll keep thinking about that one. Was the marriage arranged by a chance? Maybe that's why she did, she doesn't ma mention her mm -hmm. husband. She might not have been in love with him. Uh, okay, we we don't know exactly who Maria was, who uh, how. I mean, uh, if uh, the husband was still alive, it seems from the more recent research that uh, uh, the, the husband uh, was no more alive. And uh, uh, there is this uh, character, Bernardino, uh, who usually was uh, interpreted as the husband. But it seems that uh, no, he was not the husband. He was uh, a person who was in charge to control, <laughs> to control Maria. Uh, <laughs> 
but it's true that, uh, uh, as uh, Jane said, uh, there is a kind of theatrical component <laughs> in, the, in the way in which uh, uh, Maria tries to, to organize uh, their meetings and so on. And also, there is uh, some uh, important Venetian elements. There is a gondola. <laughs> there is a, so it's, it's very interesting, also from this point of view. But I don't know if it's known whether the marriage was arranged. It's probably very likely given the shoes of social class. Um, but I don't know if that's a detail that the archives still hold for us to find out. How old was he and how old was she when they had this love affair? Was she older than He was 30. Do we know her age exactly? Do we don't, I don't think we know exactly when she was born. Bembo was 30. Uh, OK. It's, uh, we are at the beginning uh, of Cinquecento. Uh, so I don't remember exactly when uh, Bembo uh, was born. Per controllare Stefano. I think he was 30 or like this. It sounds like she was a little older than him because she was a widow with four children. She could have been married at 15. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. So they may have been the same age, I mean, but. Si, 30 years. Si, 30 years. Or 30, 30 years. But he was, I mean, it was not too young, but he was really at the beginning of his career. Because uh, he has a tattoo between the traditional role of his family as a, a, very, a very important part of the Venetian government or other solutions. So he was really young, but not only from the point of view of uh, the age, but from the point of view of choosing uh, uh, his life. He kept running for elections and losing. <laughs> so you get a sense that his political career was not exactly taking off at this, at this point. Did he write in, in the Italian of Tuscany? With, or was he also influenced by the Venetian? Oh. He wrote in a, a language that is very, very close to the Tuscan language. It's very liter lit literato. We don't know, maybe in the original, in the original letters, he was more Venetian. But in, uh, I mean, in the Azolani, for example, we found Tuscan. I mean, it's a very, uh, literate uh, language. But I found very, <laughs> very amazing the reactions of uh, Donizotti and also Monsignor. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting because if you look of how this letter uh, were concerned, because uh, the danger has been that the letters were destroyed. <laughs> But at the same time, the librarian of Ambrosiana and the Carlo Dionisotti, in the different moments, I mean, they have the problems of justify themselves <laughs> because they decided to publish these love letters from a woman. So it's very funny to, <laughs> to look how, how they reacted to this. I might have a comment um, plus a question um, regarding the passage where uh, the lovers talk about burning the paper and when you say that um, the letters become an erotic object. Mm? Because this refers to a fascinating point I am exploring um, in my research in the fictional uh, love letter collections. Um, that is to say, First, first thing, the role of objects in uh, the emotional economy of love stories. And second, the impact of literary culture on the way these objects are perceived and so become able to generate illicit as well as um, express um, emotions. 
Mm, to give you a couple of starting points, Roland Barthes and more recently the uh, historians Sarah Ahmed and Katie Barclay have explored this dimension from a theoretical perspective. Uh, Barthes focuses on objects mentioned in literature and uses the category of metonymic objects. That is to say, uh, two characters uh, that are lovers cannot be physically together, so they project their desire onto objects that are connected to the beloved, such as portraits or locks of hair or pieces of paper that have been touched or kissed by the beloved. So these uh, objects receive a charge of erotic meaning because they are connected to the body or soul of the beloved. Uh, Ahmed and Barclay, uh, they um, primarily consider real objects as they are historians, so not objects in, uh, mentioned in literature, uh, they focus on the emotional interaction between people and objects, which is, of course, featured in literature too. If we think of uh, Petrarch experiencing frustration in front of the portrait of Laura. Um, Barclay, in particular, speaks of ritual objects. Uh, she says that, of course, every object can receive a charge of meaning, but some objects more than others. In our culture, for instance, in a romantic relationship, the gift of a diamond ring uh, has a heavier charge than the gift of a necklace, for instance. And in Renaissance culture, literature appears to decree which objects have the heavier charge of meaning. The, portraits, the portrait, for instance, is very important, but also the gloves, which you mentioned, they are in Petrarch, and then Bembo uses them too as metonymic, as real metonymic objects, not just mentioning them, but uh, exchanging them with one of, their, uh, of his lovers. So when this uh, happens in um, fictional love letters, Okay, it's literature that influences literature. Dionysotti's rule is still valid. We are in our comfort zone as literary specialists. But um, so, uh, yeah, for instance, uh, Bembo calling his love letters lettere giovanili is a safe territory because he's just using Petrarch to manipulate his own biography, to make it literary. But when this happens in real life, uh, in Maria's case, for instance, um, as you said, we have uh, a woman who is using literature to make sense of what she feels. Uh, more precisely, precisely, she's using the literary code to make sense of what she feels. And in the history of emotions, Barbara Rosenwein has recently written about this in her book that I showed you before, Love, a History in Five Fantasies. Um, so, so this is in the history of emotions. But in, in the field of literary studies, uh, we have seen that Dionisotti was not very at ease with this. And since we have you here, I'd love to hear what both of you think of this uh, life literature connection, also from a methodological point of view, specifically about the Renaissance. Thank you. I am very interested in this uh, problem. And uh, uh, for example, I, I seen how, I have seen how some uh, art historian used uh, uh, some anthropological research on uh, uh, the idea of agency. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that uh, uh, this perspective can be useful also for us, can, under, can help us to understand the relationship between not only word and images, but objects, objects. And uh, yeah, I think this is a fascinating perspective. And I think that we can uh, we can do more research on uh, on this. I just I think that Lena brought out quite beautifully in her talk the relevance of these objects in the letters, whether it's a portrait, whether it's hair, whether it's a book, whether it's the carta, the paper itself. Um, and I think you know I'm always reminded of. Jerome uses this phrase. Petrarch uses this phrase. It's very common in epistolary literature, but it's just like, you know when friends need to be absent from one another, the only thing that can make them present to one another is the physical is the physical project of writing and the physical proof of those thoughts. And so I think that this goes back, you know, thousands of years really to, you know, really classical antiquity and the way yeah. that letters were imagined as being somehow inadequate replacements, but at least some form of a physical replacement that the person who dictated or wrote that letter, you know, had 
touched, had breathed on, had, had handled, had given to a messenger, and then to send it off. So this relationship or this dynamic between presence and absence I think is really quite interesting. And I, you know, one of the curious things, again, about this letter, as I said, I mean, they're seeing each other, it seems, rather frequently, but they're also exchanging letters quite frequently. So you don't get that same presence-absence dimension, but you do get, you know, but they're also not husband and wife, they're not living together, and they never will be able to live together, as it will. And so I think that in this case, it takes on a really special charge, as it were. Yeah, this, um, um, it's interesting that you mentioned the anthropological side because this is not in, in Western tradition. It might be uh, sorry, just uh, a literary thing, uh, but uh, we find these kind of things also, for instance, in Japanese literature. In a, I don't remember exactly the name, the title of the first uh, novel, maybe Genji story or something like that. Yeah, um, written by a woman in the 12th century, and uh, there are uh, things like this. So it's not just literature; it's anthropology together with literature. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Can we have uh, questions or comments from uh, the audience online? If there is anybody that has okay. Can write it in and then it. Okay. So Julian, do we have uh, questions or comments from the online audience? There is one, Stefano. Uh, okay. Can you send it to Stefano? Okay. Uh, maybe the microphone. <laughs> Laura Kinlon asked, are these letters available in English? <laughs> and another question uh, from Laura Kinlon, marriages of convenience, it seems to me, were very common among upper classes. Is this true? Sorry, can you repeat that? If the marriage of convenience or arranged marriages were very common in the upper classes. Absolutely. So maybe Jane or Lena, do you want to answer? No, I just, no. I, yes. The the answer is yes. But any other question from the online audience? Oh yeah. No, not yet. Uh, but we should work on it. Yeah. 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 I'm available for the uh, for dealing with them in Italian, but we need someone who <laughs> to translate them in English. Okay. Yeah. True. And finally, in the English edition, they could be brought back together? Yeah. Good yeah. question. Yeah. Um, since uh, the last question was uh, about uh, upper classes and lower classes, maybe I can just add that, um, okay, this might seem a refined game for uh, rich and noble people, but um, this uh, spread also among uh, regular literate people uh, we have in, in 15th century well sorry in the 16th century we have also popular publications uh, cheap uh, books um, featuring uh, the Petrarchan um, Topoi and uh, also um, Bembo's letters one publication in, in particular published I, I think in 1553 if I'm not wrong is called uh, Concetti Amorosi di Bembo so uh, they they had also a, a popular. They were popular not only uh, among uh, the very very uh, culture. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Sorry. Il segretario Galante. As uh, um, as Isa said, it's interesting because. Uh, at the beginning uh, of uh, the age of printing uh, in, the Ven in Venice, um, not only in Venice, but first of all in Venice uh, at the uh, half of the 16th century, uh, there, were, there was a very interesting production of books, very popular, cheap sometimes, uh, that are supposed to 
to create a mediation between the library, the great volumes, uh, and uh, how you can use this. Uh, with David, we said, okay, it's not Petrarch that uh, they use. Uh, it's a kind of, yeah, of dictionary of topoi by Petrarch that can be used. And uh, so uh, there is a very rich tradition in the 16, uh, yeah, 16th, 17th century of a dictionary. The last one in a bookstore here in this territory, the last remaining uh, Italian language bookstore, then they have a uh -huh. collection that nobody knows where it's going to go. And uh -huh. very complicated. But there, too, for the immigrants, they had this. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So when they proposed uh, models of letters, yeah. <laughs> Secretario Galante means that if you are someone who has not a great culture and you have to, to write a letter uh, to your fiancé or to your beloved, you can use uh, yeah. some... Uh, yeah. some yes. You have to read and write, and at the same time you don't need to be... Yeah, it's, it's a different... I mean, uh, there was also the situation in which you, you cannot, you, you cannot uh, uh, write and you ask someone to write for you. Oh, you can write, but you are not a good writer. And in order to write a, a good letter to your uh, fiancé or to beloved person, you can use some uh, expression of Secretario Galanze. Any other questions or comments? Also from the online audience? No? OK, if not, I think we can thank once again Lina and Jane. Yeah, yeah, so we're going to meet again here in two weeks on the 23rd of uh, September with Paola Ugolini and Marco Faini about Bembo and about um, the women, women in uh, uh, Italian Renaissance. And now we have uh, refreshments in the courtyard. Thank you. Thank you so much, you, you, for being here and for the discussion.